the reason I called it compassion and not empathy is compassion is empathy plus a willingness to help. And that's very important, that willingness to help piece. Welcome everyone to the Mind Valley podcast. Our guest today is a poet, not your ordinary poet. I'm not going to uh, make you sit still and expose yourself to, to random, beautiful poetry, because I know you're here for a transformation. So this poet is someone that speaks on many fascinating topics, but one of the key things that she speaks about is on building a home for your soul. And I want to read out a quote from this poet, Najwa Zebian. The biggest mistake we make is that we build our homes in other people. We build those homes and we decorate them with the love and care and the respect that makes us feel safe at the end of the day. We invest in other people and we evaluate our self-worth based on how much these homes welcome us. But what many don't realize is that when you build your home on other people, you give them the power to make you homeless. When these people walk away, these homes walk away with them. And all of a sudden we feel empty because everything that we had within us, we put into them. We trusted someone else with pieces of us. The emptiness we feel doesn't mean we have nothing to give or that we have nothing within us. It's just that we built our home in the wrong place. So today, with the guide of Najwa Zivian, you're going to learn how to build a home for your soul. And Najwa is going to cover eight ideas that you can dive into to create this home for your soul. These ideas will span areas such as self-love, compassion, clarity, surrender, forgiveness, but the way she describes it is going to be, well, poetic and life transforming. Najwa's book, Welcome Home, A Guide to Building a Home for Your Soul, came out on June 1st. Definitely check out the book. Najwa, welcome to Mind Valley. Thank you for having me. First, because our audience is so diverse, um, mm-hmm. The, the Mind Valley audience is, is not purely American. Um, we, the audience comes from 200 different countries. People are curious about your, your, your heritage, the, um, your look, the name. It's exotic. Where are you originally from? I'm originally from Lebanon. I was born and raised there, and I moved to Canada at 16. Um, and I actually tell this story in Welcome Home as part of my journey home to myself. Thank you. So what made you write Welcome Home? My life, my long search for feeling like I was valuable, that I was worthy, that I was important to someone, that I was part of something. I remember from a very young age feeling like something was missing. And and it had to do with that emotional safety of, expressing myself and not being told you're too sensitive or you're not being grateful by complaining about, you know, having certain feelings or I just always felt that something was missing and it was that emotional safety. And as a child, you don't know how to name that. So you just think something must be wrong with me. That's how you internalize it. And that's how I internalized it. Say I was bullied in school, not having a place to, in a healthy way, talk about it at the end of the day made me internalize that maybe I deserved that. Maybe that's the most that I could ever get. And one thing about my childhood that, you know, I believe was very monumental in terms of the way that I shaped my belief about myself was that I lived with multiple relatives because long story short, my parents met and got married in Canada, had five children. And one day my oldest sister came home and my dad spoke to her in Arabic, which is our first language. And she didn't know how to answer. So my dad said, I need to teach my kids their first language. So they moved to Lebanon and I was born eight years later. So there was a big age gap between me and my parents, me and my siblings. And when my siblings started coming back to Canada to pursue education or whatever, I stayed back home and lived with whatever relative could take care of me, which meant I never had a consistent sense 
of home. I never had, I just, my home was my backpack. It was, it had everything I needed. So at the age of 13, a friend of mine, the only friend of mine, gave me a journal on my birthday. And she said, you should try to write in this. So I remember the first time I just sat down to write how I was feeling without having someone say back to me, you're too sensitive, or you shouldn't be complaining about this, or this is too much. It felt like the most liberating thing ever. And I just came back to that journal. So now my home was my journal. And I would write about, you know, feeling like I wanted to feel loved, I wanted to feel cared for. And, you know, the rest is history. That's when I started writing. And then, you know, when I turned 16, I moved to Canada, not with the intention of fully moving here. I was just coming to visit my family. They were all here at the time. And the war broke out in Lebanon. This would have been summer of 2006. And when I arrived here and the war broke out, I obviously couldn't go back to Lebanon at that time. So taking it back to writing, when I would sit down to write how I was feeling and my hopes for the future, that one day things will get better. One day I will feel, you know, fully embraced by someone or like I actually belong, like I matter. All of a sudden, it was so painful to write about that because on top of acknowledging and validating for myself how I was feeling, there was also an attached hopelessness of there's nothing I can do about it. So the fact that I was so certain there was nothing I could do about it to change it just made me not want to feel those feelings in the first place. So I ripped up my journal and I said, I'm never writing again. And uh, fast forward seven years of living what I describe now as a black and white life, because I, I really didn't feel I was very numb, very sad underneath, but extremely numb. And I just went through life, you know, I did what my parents wanted me to do in, in university, I followed the path that society told me I needed to follow. I was a good person, good girl, good everything. But you know, I wasn't really living. I became a teacher and my very first teaching assignment, the principal walked in and he had eight students with him. And, you know, they were, I could tell they were, you know, from grade one or two to grade eight. And he said to me, those kids are your responsibility for the rest of the year. They just arrived from Libya and, you know, Libya had been torn by war that year. And he said, it's your responsibility to teach them English. It's your responsibility to get them, you know, do whatever it take to, takes to make sure they're integrated, they're included, they belong, everything. And I'll never forget that moment and exactly where we were standing, because looking at them, I saw the look in their eyes that I knew I had when I was 16 when I first arrived in Canada, feeling like, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. And something within me woke up and said, you need to tell these kids you fit in. You don't even need to fit in like you belong here. You don't need to fight for your place. You don't need to, you know, shut yourself out so that you could feel welcomed. And so I started writing short snippets about how I believe education is about students and for students. And the way I just to best describe this is, you know, when I started writing, writing to heal others was okay because it was, you know, I'm helping someone else. But that writing led me back to that 16 year old self of mine who never healed. And I started healing her through my writing. So I was in a beautiful way helping others heal by helping myself heal. And, you know, a couple of years later, I self-published my first collection of writings, which is that's how it started. All of those writings that I wrote about education and feelings of, you know, I I'm not confident enough or I don't belong here. Or, you know, if someone was dishonest with me, I'm just writing all these reflections and anyone who would read them. And it was just, you know, teachers in the school and my students they would say, we need these in one place. So I self-published Mind Platter in 2016. 
And it was just all that's on my mind written, you know, um, served on a silver platter. And then I self-published another book, got approached by a publisher and wrote, sorry, my third book, excuse me, I wrote my third book, Sparks of Phoenix. And then a very interesting theme that came through all those books was home. And when I was asked to do my very first TEDx talk after self-publishing Mind Platter, the theme was, it's about time. And my, the first thing that came to me was, it's about time to heal. It's about time to feel. And the title came to me, Finding Home Through Poetry. And right before I went on stage, I had been preparing for this speech for like six months. Right before I went on stage, I just, I forgot everything. And I said to myself, I knew I wasn't the type that memorizes. I speak from my heart. I, 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 that's how I function in life. So I just said, Nejwa, say what your heart needs to say. So these words that you just read about the biggest mistake we make is that we build our homes and other people. It was in that moment that they just came out of me. And I remember later that day, I went to my hotel room and I started imagining like, it's a beautiful thing to say, let me build a home within, but how do I actually do that? So I started imagining the structure of a home and what makes a home strong, what makes it last for a long time, what makes it safe and what makes it welcoming. And so this was in 2016 and the idea was just forming itself in my mind. So fast forward to the time after I published my third book. Now I got a new agent and I was looking for a new publisher. I went to New York, met with my agents for the first time. And I knew I wanted to write a book on, you know, letting go, not just letting go of people, but letting go of dreams you had for yourself, letting go of certain beliefs, letting go of certain identities that no longer resemble you. And I was explaining that to them. And I said, but the title is not coming to me. But, you know, a few years ago when I was talking about building a home, as soon as I started imagining the home, the title was there, Welcome Home. And they both looked at each other and looked at me and said, that's the book you need to write. So within two weeks, I had a publishing deal. I had written my proposal. Like it was just meant to happen at that moment. But you see, my whole life's journey led me to that moment where Mark and Tess, my agents, were looking at each other and saying, that's the book you need to write. And it just flowed like a river that's from me. Really, that's a really beautiful story, Najwa. And I'm so happy you. you took us through that story because there's also so much to unwrap there. How, yes. how you became such an acclaimed poet, how you, you, you got over a million fans on Instagram, you got a TED Talk, all, and, and it was amazing how all the events in your life lined up to make you who you are today. Yes. So that was beautiful to, to, to hear. Thank you. Now you were going to share with us eight ideas to create a home yes. with your soul. Now I know mm-hmm. you can, most of these ideas are, are covered in that in your book. Welcome yes. home. And so mm-hmm. for those of you who find any of these nuggets interesting, I encourage you to go to Najwa's website or to Amazon and get yourself that book. But let's start with these eight nuggets of wisdom that you're going to share with mm-hmm. us. So I've broken down the process of building a home within in a way, basically welcome home combines storytelling with practical strategies with poetry. So it's meant to help you build that home within, but not just from a place of I'm telling you what to do. It's from a place of I've experienced this. This is how I did it. This is how you can do it. So It's a beautiful combination of feeling heard and validated and feeling empowered to make the change. So the very first step is the road to home. What road do you need to take to get to a place where you can start building that home within? Because I guarantee that most of the people listening know everything there is to know about self-love and forgiveness and compassion with yourself and others and clarity on yourself in the world and surrendering to your emotions and, you know, living your dream. But there's a missing piece when it comes to transferring that logic to practice. And for me, that missing piece was understanding what belief I had about myself 
that I lived by, even though on a logical level, I knew it wasn't true about me, but I functioned that way. And that road that had to be taken was all the way back to my childhood. I was speaking to a new therapist and she said to me, something tells me that you went through something at around the age of eight or nine that shaped your belief that you are not worthy of being loved and held onto. And the moment she said that, I tears started gushing because I knew exactly what had happened. And I went back to, a, to the story when I would have been, you know, eight or nine at the time. And I was staying at my uncle's house at the time, my aunt's house. And um, it was the night before a major celebration for us. It was like the night before Christmas, you know, everybody gets gifts. And um, my cousins who I was playing with, um, all of a sudden they were called by my aunt to go downstairs. And I'm, I am getting a little bit emotional as I tell this story. And I, I, I always get emotional when I tell it. Um, they were asked to go downstairs for family time. And I was asked to stay in the room because obviously that family didn't include me. And I remember just hearing their laughs and their happiness, their joy, their opening gifts. Look what I got. Look, And, you know, as a little kid, I'm asking myself internally, why can't I have that? And the way I describe it in Welcome Home is that wasn't the gifts or the, you know, the candy or it was the love. It was feeling like I was important to someone. And since that moment, when I reflected back on my whole life and now how I had been functioning, it was from a place of, I can't have that. Whether it was not getting a job opportunity, it was because I knew internally, I can't have that feeling of feeling valued and, and, and someone saw my worth. And that was the conclusion I went to. That was the ending of the story that I went to every single time. So once I got that and welcome home, I say, one of the strategies is what is your, why can't I have that story? Like you have to figure that out because once you figure it out, you can say, it's not that I can't have that. It's that I haven't had that yet. It's that I don't have that. So what can I do to have that? Because if I walk through life genuinely believing that that is impossible, whatever it is, I'm never going to see the possibility when it comes my way. And I'm always going to follow the patterns and the paths that will take me to that conclusion. You know, it's confirmation bias. I'm going to want to, you know, prove that to myself. So in the road to home, you remove the blocks. And the way I describe it is it's a roadblock and you turn it into, a, into bricks that are taking you on your way, on your road to the place where you can start building that home. The second thing you do is building a strong foundation. Just think of a house. If you do not have a foundation, you do not have an everlasting home. You don't have something that will weather the storms, a place for actual safety. So, which if you were to think about it in a practical way and look at your own life, if you know so much about self-love, only when your friends ask you or only when you see something on TV and think, oh, that's wrong, you know, that's not self-love. But when it comes to your own life, you don't know how to, you know, put that into practice. It's probably because you haven't taken the time to build the foundation. And for me, the foundation, this is lesson number two, is made of self-acceptance and self-awareness. Those two elements are so important. Self-awareness of what brought you to this point in your life, what made you the person that you are today. Be aware of the story. Be aware of all the stories. And be aware in the moment of how you behave, how you carry yourself, how you respond, how you react, how you internalize things. And the second element is self-acceptance. And self-acceptance, I talk about two types of self-acceptance in Welcome Home. Shallow self-acceptance and deep self-acceptance. Shallow self-acceptance is when you think, this is who I am. I'm just, I don't care what people think of me. 
you know, it's, it's kind of what you see on social media nowadays where people just say, I don't care. You know, if you think I'm rude, I don't really care. This is who I am. It might be that you are accepting the version of yourself that is a reaction to the world around you or a reaction to what you've experienced up to this point. Deep self-acceptance is all about you. It has nothing to do with how the world perceives you. A byproduct of deep self-acceptance is not caring what the world thinks of you, but it's not the goal. That's not self-acceptance. Self-acceptance is you're able to look at yourself as you are, isolated from all the labels, from all the expectations, from all the things that you know, you've been made to believe you should or should not do or should or should not be and say, I accept myself as I am. Even though I have flaws, even though I have weaknesses, I accept myself. Once you've built that strong foundation, when you practice the next elements, self-love, forgiveness, compassion, clarity, surrender, and walking through the dream garden, you are not practicing them through someone else's eyes. You're practicing them on the foundation of you, authentic you, self-accepting, self-aware you. So the third thing, and these are the rooms now. So we've moved from the road to the foundation. Now you have self-love. That's the first room and welcome home. So not sure, let's first. do a quick recap. So the first, the first idea that you shared was self-awareness. Yes. Okay, then self-acceptance. Yes. And now we're about to get to self-love and then forgiveness. Do you yes. continue? Yes. So self-love, and the reason I put it as the first room or chapter in Welcome Home is I believe it is, it's one of the most powerful things you can do for yourself. And at the same time, it's the most misunderstood, I would say, because we, when we think of self-love, we think, oh, I'm going to take a spa day or I'm going to buy myself something or but self-love is about giving yourself what you need. It's about giving yourself what you would give a loved one of yours when they need something. So I always ask this question. Think of the list of people who you love the most, two or three people. Do you see yourself next to those people? Do you treat yourself the way that you treat those people? For example, Someone you deeply love comes home at the end of the day. They've had a bad day. Do you not ask them, what do you need from me right now? What can I do for you? You make them a meal. You go and do something for them that makes them feel loved the way they need it. Do you do that for yourself? Because if you don't, then that means you don't see yourself as one of your most loved ones. And whether you like it or not, you should be your most loved person. You should be your number one priority, not anyone or anything else. Yes, at certain times, you need to put yourself aside to prioritize something or someone else, but you never, ever, ever take yourself off of your priority list or break yourself down or show yourself self-hatred to be there for someone else. So self-love is all about treating yourself the way you treat your most loved ones and not accepting for yourself what you would never accept for someone you love. And that's deeply powerful, deeply, deeply powerful. So some of the strategies that I talk about in Welcome Home is in, in that chapter in particular, one of them is switching to self-love mode. And you just, just imagine that you're, you know, flicking a switch the moment you catch yourself speaking to yourself from self-hatred, you just say, I'm switching to self-love mode, even if it's for five minutes. Anything that you are saying to yourself, say the opposite of it. Because just like we memorize songs on the radio and they just you know, slip off our tongue without us even thinking about them, that self-hatred tape that you've been or self-sabotaging tape that you've been playing to yourself is easily going to slip off your tongue because you've been speaking to yourself that way your whole life. So you need to change what you're saying. You actually have to verbalize it and make that what slips off your tongue, 
not, you know, you know, the first, the first instinct you have when you mess up is sometimes like, oh, I'm so stupid or, or, or how could I have done that? You need to change what first comes to you by practicing saying the positive thing. So that's self-love. Moving on to forgiveness, which that was one of the hardest chapters to write because I remember when I sat down to write it, I was writing what forgiveness means. Forgiveness is about letting go. It's not about saying what you did to me is okay or what they did to me is okay or that it will ever be okay or that it, it wasn't bad enough. It's simply about no longer giving it power over your current situation, your current present situation and moment. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I have blocked out stories from my life where I was treated in such a way that it took me so long to be able to not think of those stories. So I didn't even think, have I forgiven those people? I just thought I had excelled in my career. I had broken out of so many cultural, religious, societal norms and I, you know, I was really strong at this point. And how could I, where I, with where I am in my life right now, still have something or someone to forgive? I couldn't sit with that. So one of the pillars that I have in that room, and every room has pillars, you know, because we're using the analogy of a home. One of the pillars is having someone or something to forgive is not shameful. It doesn't matter where you are in life what you've accomplished, the fact that you've been through something that you still need to forgive is not weakness. It just means you've tucked it away long enough because maybe you couldn't handle reliving it over and over. And maybe it was good for you that you actually blocked it out of your mind for so long. So I sat there and I thought of everyone that I still needed to forgive. And I just decided the fact that I still have that, you know, tense reaction every time I think back to what happened means that still has over power over me. And I don't want that. I don't believe that my past or anyone from my past has more power over my present moment than I do. So I started that process and I started making sense of you know, what took me so long to be able to just become neutral to the story and say, you know what, that happened to me. It had nothing to do with who I am. And it was, it was me believing on some level that my vulnerability, my, you know, being naive, being young, being sheltered, my upbringing of, you know, living in a very conservative religiously and culturally conservative environment like i still believed that i somehow positioned myself in a way to deserve that pain and i had to get rid of that and say it doesn't matter how vulnerable or naive or sheltered or inexperienced or whatever it is it doesn't matter how much of those things you were it still does not give someone the right to cause you pain or take advantage of those things. Or, you know, that's one of the people said, you know, these mountains you are carrying, you were only supposed to climb are the most powerful words they've heard by me. To me, it was like, I am carrying mountains that are not mine to carry. I'm not the one who inflicted pain. I'm the one who experienced that pain. And my job is not to make sense of what they did to me or why they did it to me. My job is to say, I know I didn't deserve that. And I know that I have the power to build a life moving forward that should I ever feel that someone is trying to take advantage of me or someone is trying to, you know, even if someone is dishonest with me or someone just treats me in a way that I don't, accept from a place of self-love 
I know that I have the power to say, you don't belong in my life. This doesn't belong in my life. So the forgiveness chapter is one of the most powerful chapters in Welcome Home. I mean, they're all powerful, but the forgiveness chapter, once you're done reading it, you will feel that the most powerful person in your life is you right now. doesn't matter what you've been through. It's not about erasing the story. It's about making peace with it and making peace with yourself, forgiving yourself. There's a poem right at the end of that chapter that begins with, I wish I could go back to the exact moment before the moment I walked out my door that night. Because I caught myself in a moment where I was wishing the pain away. I was like, you know, if that story didn't happen, how good would my life be right now? And I knew that was the wrong way to think because there was no way I would become who I am today without having gone through that story, without having, the way I describe it is I was burnt down to ashes to rise as a phoenix from that experience. I would not have been so burnt down or burnt out had that not happened. That doesn't mean I say, you know, it should have happened and it should happen to everybody. No, but it did. There's no point in wishing it away. I need to give myself credit for getting out of it. I need to give myself credit for healing. I need to give myself credit for not making myself a cold hearted person as a reaction to the coldness that someone else treated me with. Thank now you for that, Najwa. Yeah. So- as I'm looking at the comments coming in, um, I'm seeing people mm-hmm. write, this is therapy for my soul. <laughs> so, and so people are really resonating with this. Uh, Mohammed wrote, definitely, wow. So the reason why I'm not running this like an interview and I'm not interrupting Najwa is because as a poet, Najwa is very articulate with her words and her story is inspiring. And I wanted her to just speak to you guys from her soul. Um, but at the same time, to take you through Um, a framework that you can understand. So let's quickly Mm -hmm. recap that framework, okay? The foundation, the foundation to creating this home for your soul is understanding self-awareness and self-acceptance. Those two are are a requirement, self-awareness and self-acceptance. And then once you have that foundation, you are building this home for your soul. And think of this home as a house with six rooms. We've covered the first two, self-love and forgiveness, And we're about to now cover the third room, which is compassion. Now, Najwa, what I find interesting about this is these three rooms, self-love, forgiveness, compassion, they mirror exactly methodologies in the six phase meditation, which is the meditation Mm -hmm. model I invented. And it's the, it's Mm -hmm. my next book. My next book coming out with Penguin is called the six phase. And in this meditation, we go through three phases in the beginning. And the phases are are actually compassion, self-love, and forgiveness. So wow. your work and my work parallel each other in a really yes. way. I'm curious to see if the next phases, if the, if the yes. next three rooms, Clarity, Surrender, yes. Dream Garden, also mirror what, what I cover. So let's yes. now talk about room number three, which is compassion. Um, and we want to make sure that for the next four, Compassion, Clarity, Surrender, Dream Garden, we, we go faster so we have time to fit it into this podcast. And again, those of you who want to go deeper, uh, don't worry, because you can always get Najwa's book, Welcome Home. Yes. Najwa? So the compassion room is the reason I called it compassion and not empathy is compassion is empathy plus a willingness to help. And that's very important, that willingness to help piece. The compassion room is all about compassion towards yourself and compassion towards the world. And so that's why in that room, I've talked about how you build boundaries. And, you know, the final step in building a boundary is actually setting it. And the reason I use that word build is it's extremely difficult to wake up one day and say, I'm just enforcing this boundary because I know it's what's right for me. You know, that's beautiful, but not practical. Most of us struggle with you know, immediate change, especially if you're an empath and you really care about how people perceive your actions, you want to make sure that you do it at a pace that is 
good for you in a way where you're not going to relapse or apologize for setting that boundary or, you know, trying to build it with someone. So the compassion room is the room that I say it's the only room where you're allowed to welcome people into your home. Because if someone isn't walking to into your home with empathy and with a willingness to be there for you in whatever way you need, when you need them to be there, they do not deserve that welcome. And one of the strategies I have in that room is think of if you had a dinner, who would be on your guest list? Who are the people that you would invite because you feel like they genuinely care about you, they're genuinely good to you. And this is very personal. Nobody's going to have access to this list. And then I say, you know, if one of those people say they walked in and they insulted you or they insulted someone that you love, what would you do? You would definitely either ask them to leave or once they leave, you don't invite them back. So why don't you do that with people in your daily life who insult you or treat you in a way that doesn't show full empathy and full acceptance of you? Why don't you do that? And then the second thing I ask is, are you on your guest list? When you welcome people into your life, do you consider yourself part of that welcome? Because if you don't, if the moment you have someone walk into your life, all of your focus is on them and you completely forget about feeding yourself or giving yourself, feeding your soul, giving yourself whatever it is that you need, that's not good. You have to be on that list. So the compassion room, as I said, is just, it's all about setting proper and proper, relatively speaking, is all, it's all relative to you. Proper boundaries with the people in your life, knowing when to ask someone to leave, knowing, you know, the frequency of how many times you allow someone into your life. And a practical example would be, say, a family m- member has really put conditions on how they accept you in their life. You can choose to see them once or twice a year. You can choose to see them, whatever works for you. It's all about how often am I allowing someone into that sacred space that I've created within. So that's the compassion room. Moving to the clarity room. The clarity room is all about seeing yourself as you are. And before you move there, Najwa, I just put out a comment that Natasha wrote in our chat. Natasha is a Mind Mm -hmm. Valley member. And uh, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, members come backstage with me and get to interact with our authors and attend these calls. So Natasha wrote, I love how you speak straight through your heart and soul while also giving us a clear (laughs) glimpse of the framework you use to make it so simple for us. Did not read the book yet, but I'm already excited to roam your house and reveal (laughs) all the hidden treasures. Aw, that's, thank you so much for saying that. Um, Thank you for welcoming everything that I have to say um, into your soul. So, so we have about 10 minutes left um, in recording time. Uh, And we're going to talk about the next three rooms, Clarity, Surrender, Mm -hmm. the Dream Garden. And just give us an overview because I really want to encourage people who want to go deeper because so many people are just loving this. I want to encourage them to get the book. (laughs) So the clarity room is all about seeing yourself as you are. And the best way I could describe it to you is if you were to look at yourself in the mirror right now, can you actually see yourself? If you said, who am I? Can you answer that question? I guarantee that you can't because there is a blur in that mirror. If you haven't asked yourself that question ever, or if the last time you asked yourself that question was years ago, What happens is it's like the mirror that's in front of you has been so dusty and so blurred that you can't see yourself. And that blur is made of all that society told you you needed to be, all that your family, your culture, your religion, your work, your school told you you needed to be. So you are seeing yourself through that blur and you can't see yourself that way without seeing yourself as not good enough, as you need to do certain things that add to yourself or take away from yourself. Or So the work is all about removing that blur. And one of the strategies, the only one that I'll talk about in that room is the blank canvas mirror. 
Look at your life as it is right now. Write it all out in detail and ask yourself, do I believe that this is how I should be living? If the answer is no, X that out. Erase it. Until you have a canvas that only has the ways, the identities, the beliefs that you genuinely from a self-accepting and self-aware and self-loving place that you believe you should be living by and living through. That's the clarity room. The surrender room is all about allowing yourself to experience the emotions that are knocking on your door. And I say, when pain knocks on your door, let it in, sit with it, have tea with it, understand it, then walk it to the door because it's time for you to welcome something new. Don't think that avoiding that knock of whatever emotion it is that's demanding to be felt by you is going to make that pain go away. Because that door that the emotion is knocking on is not outside of you, it's within you. Whatever you ignore, what you're doing is, practically speaking, ignoring the knock means that you are adapting your life to that noise in the background. And that is not a way to live. And I also say in that chapter, just like your heart, just like your eyes adapt to the darkness, so does your heart. So if you allow yourself to live in a dark space for too long, you start believing this is the place I can see, you know, I can live through this. I can, I can survive through this. That's not a whole life to live. That's not full. That's not actually living. So, and one of the other things about that room that I realized as I was writing it is it's not just about the resistance we have in the way of experiencing negative emotions, but it's also positive ones. And if you have spent your life believing that you need to work hard and experience hardship to get somewhere, when a positive emotion comes to you, you just push it away. You don't even open yourself to it because you just don't believe that you think you're selfish for experiencing it. So the surrender room teaches you how to welcome both and how to come from an authentic place in the way that you deal with your emotions, heal from them, the way that you embrace them. And the dream garden is all about living your dream and not chasing it. So this is all about your purpose in life. It's all about how you define failure. It's all about how you define who you are without labels of I do that, you know, I'm a I'm Nezra Zabian, I'm a teacher, I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I'm a, uh, you know, I, I, I help people heal with certain things, but who are you without achieving any of that? Because the dream garden is all about if you are living your life authentically, if you are doing what feels authentic to you, and you're somehow relating that to the work that you do in life without attaching it to the monetary value, without attaching it to, you know, attaching your success or whether it's, a, it's the right path to take on the outcome, then that's it. You're golden. Then you could, you could totally say, you know, I know that what I love doing can't make me a living. But if I choose to do a job to bring in money into my life that serves me living my purpose, then I can file that in my mind as this job is serving the purpose of, you know, fulfilling my dream. And it, so everything becomes, it's in perspective for you because you know what every single thing that you are doing serves in your life. And that's it. And then the last chapter is adapting to your new reality. So that's where I talk about how to deal with people around you, you know, telling you you've changed because now you're coming from a place of I'm at home with myself. You know, I put myself first. I put my healing first. I'm authentic. I will not be fake in any way. How do you adapt to the new reality of now being a person who is at home? with yourself. Thank you so much for sharing, Najwa. And, and really what you did is you gave us not just a framework, but a tour of the book. 
Yes. When I record these podcasts, I like to make sure that we're delivering value. I like to make sure that the yes. audience walks away with things that they've scribbled down or written down in your journal that they can reflect upon. So here are the things yes. to reflect upon. The first is the foundation for the home, self-awareness and self-acceptance. And then the six rooms, self-love and forgiveness. Room number three, compassion. Then room four, five, and six, clarity, surrender, and the dream garden. And this is really the, 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 the recipe, says Najwa, for finding a home for your soul. Najwa, where can we learn more about you? <laughs> Well, you can learn more about me by reading Welcome Home. I basically tell my whole story in that book. And I just wear my heart on my sleeve. I don't care it, what how people perceive that. So not in, a, in an ignorant kind of way, but in a way that's like, this is who I am. And I hope I inspire you to be yourself. So you can find me in Welcome Home. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. LinkedIn, it's all the same username. It's Najwa Zabian, N A J W A Z E B I A N. That's, um, that, yeah. that's the advantage of having unique names like Vishen Latiani. Or yes. <laughs> Nobody else has those <laughs> domains. So you have N A J W A Z E B I A N dot com, and it's the same on your Instagram. And you can also Google Najwa Zabian TED Talk. And you will find yes. her talk on TED. It is, uh, it's right. It's called The Power of Me Too. So Najwa, thank you so much for joining us in the Mind Valley podcast. If you enjoyed this topic, check out Najwa's book, Welcome Home. And if you want to go deeper in these ideas, become a Mind Valley member. Go to mindvalley.com. And we have a variety of programs that deal with these topics. If you already are a member, pay attention to the upcoming program, The Six Phase Meditation which in particular deals with self-acceptance, compassion, and forgiveness in a really deep way. I'll see you on the next Mind Valley podcast.